particular guests and participants. Before officially beginning the program, I would humbly request all participants to ensure their mobile phones are switched to silent mode. Thank you. On behalf of the Islamabad Policy Research Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's special lecture. Our subject today will be on Hindutva particularism, a threat to Indian Union. We are fortunate to have with us today Dr. Muhammad Majib Afzal to speak with us on the subject today. Dr. Afzal is Associate Professor at the School of Politics and International Relations, Kaide Azam University. He is author of the book titled BJP and the Indian Muslims, which was published in 2014. Dr. Afzal is an expert on Indian domestic issues, and he regularly participates in national and international conferences. Thank you so much for being with us here today, sir. Now, with commencing with the program, I would like to request Acting President Brigadier Rashid Wali Janjua to please offer some opening remarks. All of us. When I say all of us, uh, that includes uh, Pakistan as well as the regional countries, which are uh, bearing the brunt of uh, an exclusivist ideology, which threatens to uh, disturb not only the regional peace, but internal harmony of India itself. Hindutva ideology is uh, Hindu nationalism in its most virulent form. And uh, it is a kind of a ideology that is that believes in otherness, that believes in exclusivism, that believes in erasing the cultural and political identity of all minorities that uh, inhabit the Indian subcontinent. India, as we all know, uh, when it got independence, uh, it was weaned on promises of uh, Nehruvian secularism and uh, secular nationalism. That nationalism at that point of time was also challenged by another virulent strain, which was uh, religious nationalism of Golwalkar, Hajwar, and uh, based upon the teachings of Savarkar. Now, these competing nationalisms jockeyed for influence. And till the time the Indian secular nationalism's ideals held, this nationalism remained in subterranean strata, but it kept rearing its ugly heads. It actually got opportunity uh, in the 80s once BJP started getting uh, into the electoral politics. And uh, it's a fact that Hajwar-based Hindu nationalism on which this Hindutva concept is based, it did not believe in independence of India and it did not participate in the uh, independence movement against the British. So in order to now become holier than the Pope and in order to rediscover their credentials and in, in order to erase the cultural identity and uh, you know, sweep India in a milestorm of uh, xenophobia and misanthropy, this creed is doing its best to introduce concepts like Ghar Wapsi, which in simple terms means that all inhabitants whether they came from Central Asia, whether they came from Middle East, and uh, they adopted a new faith and lived in harmony uh, like the India was since millennia, it should erase its religious and cultural symbols and embrace the old faith. Now, a word about old faith also. We read uh, uh, in the works of Romila Thapar, She's written uh, Distant uh, Visions, a book which is uh, based upon the impressions of uh, those who dissented from this version of Hindutva. And uh, she recalls uh, the two, uh, first millennium BC in which the Vedas, for the first time, 
they uh, came up with this concept of hindu uh, ramayana and mahabharata there was a resistance against that strain even then and then in the first uh, uh, you know one uh, first to uh, 7th century ad there was yet again resistance based upon a strain of uh, sanskrit which was uh, away from the mainstream strain of sanskrit that the old adherents spoke and then there was a third revolt by adavasis she says which was based upon the revolt of the forest dwellers whose land was being encroached by incessant march of uh, agricultural communities clearing the forests in many ways all those strains are visited upon india even now we know what we call maoist revolution is a revolution in in fact by those adivasis and their descendants those who have been marginalized and uh, those who have been relegated to the status of uh, scheduled castes now uh, with all this going on uh, it would have remained confined to the indian mainland perhaps but a series of uh, legal instruments used by indian government and uh, legislations like citizens amendment act and uh, national register of citizens it has started impacting countries like bangladesh because bengalis are being excluded those who migrated to assam those are con- now uh, affecting pakistan afghanistan because the muslims who went from this place even the persecuted communities they are not being given the indian citizenship so they are giving the indian citizen ship to six to jains to uh, all other uh, you know what they perceive to be the indigenous uh, strains of the hindu religion but not uh, muslims so this is this exclusion based upon religion is redolent of uh, the nazi exclusivism and it's a new kind of uh, threat a new kind of nationalism which threatens the internal harmony and india is in the fear uh, india is in the uh, clear risk of being imploded internally while uh, it does so uh, it would have its uh, ripple effect on the regional countries and that is why this is an aspect that needs to be debated discussed and showcased and uh, propagated at the world fora as to uh, what are the negative implications of this nationalism so uh, with these few words i would uh, invite today's speaker dr mujib to come and enlighten us on several dimensions that he has written in his book also and he's been speaking about these aspects a lot so over to you sir thank you uh, i'm grateful sir thank you very much um grateful to uh, ipri uh, for giving me this opportunity uh ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh every society have certain sets of ideas that essentially provide basis to evolve principles on the basis of which societies are organized they organize themselves it's a kind of an organizing principle which they create right uh, through processes of interpretation and reinterpretation again and again these set of principle essentially link these societies to their religio cultural heritage geo strategic location and provide justification for the use of power force inside and outside essentially these ideas evolve through the interaction of these three processes religio cultural heritage geo strategic location and uh, justification for the use of power or at a certain point of time the balance of power in which the societies are placed so in a historical process they evolve and help construct those elements on the basis of which identities are constructed a kind of a self definitions through which they define themselves and differentiate themselves from others 
So we generally call these elements that evolve over a longer period of time, ideology or ideologies, because they are always more than one. These ideologies emerge through a very complex and dynamic process and evolve competing ideas and competing interpretations. So ideologies are essentially not monolithic. They are competitive within and with other ideologies as well. So these ideologies are essentially the basis on which societies organizing themselves, identifying themselves or creating their self on the basis of which they are defining themselves and differentiating others. Particularism essentially emphasize those elements that differentiate these societies from others, provide these societies uniqueness and make them exceptional. So the time, the elements that essentially differentiate, unique, provide uniqueness and exceptionalism are picked up and emphasized by the exceptionalists, a kind of a exclusivist process. It demands from its members that they show devotion exclusively to these ideas and especially to those who are championing these particular interests. Argument is that you cannot be a member of more than one loyalty group. Your loyalty is with one group. Essentially, most of us think that we are part of a multi-loyalty groups. We have loyalties uh, with smaller groups, the family, uh, the town in which we are placed, the profession, and all these things. But this is a kind of a step in which multicultural societies are actually told that either you are loyal to your own community or the entire communities. You have to make a selection. And if you are not making the right selection, you are not a patriot. So in this entire process, alternative interpretations are rejected and absolutism, irrationality, and xenophobia is promoted. Minority groups are asked or coerced to accept the majority view of, their view of life and sacrifice their own self and their self-definition in order to provide proof for their patriotism. If they are, you are patriotic to us, you are patriotic, national citizen, then you will accept our definition of it. So essentially particularism is exclusively demanding those interpretations that they think in their interest and they are then implemented on other. And the myth that is created is generally absolutist, irrational, and uh, it creates xenophobia because without xenophobia, it is virtually uh, very difficult to justify why other interpretation of those ideas are being rejected. Hindutva is a religio-cultural concept that demands unity of the sacred geography. Essentially, they think Bharat, where it is situated, is a sacred, and uh, it is only meant for Hindus. Shared racial features and common culture. Essentially, they talk of some sacredity that is uh, they interpret is more than a culture. It's combination of dharma and the practices and the uh, processes through which they have evolved. So for you, if you want to be part of Hindutva, you have to be Indian by blood, by culture, and by faith. 
since Muslims and Christians are followers of the faith whose holy lands are outside India, so they are not included. They are excluded. The ideology of Hindutva was promoted essentially by the uh, uh, Mahasabha and uh, Vidi Savarkar, uh, but later on it was championed. Essentially, there were two processes. One was a popular process of uh, popular politics of uh, Hindu Mahasabha, and second was the doctrinal uh, and social process of the uh, Rashtriya Swami Sevak Sang. Uh, RSS and its Sang Parivar essentially uh, followed this uh, ideology of Hindutva, and they wished to establish hegemony of Hindu and Hinduism in India. Essentially, Hindutva ideology wish to, number one, preserve the socially privileged positions of the Brahman through reinterpretation of the caste system, because it is the caste system or the Varna system, essentially that ensure the privileged position of the Brahmans in the society. And it is this uh, structure which has sustained Hinduism uh, for 10,000 years. So the survive, social survival of Hinduism is argued that was dependent on the survival of the Brahman. So Brahman is essential. And mostly these were the Brahmans uh, who is initially started the RSS. Uh, virtually, initially, all the members were Brahman uh, and middle class, educated young men. Secondly, they wish to reform the traditional Hinduism on modern lines so it can face the challenge of modernity and Islam and Christianity. It is essentially a process through which they wish to create a kind of a uh, monolithic culture, uh, monolithic religion uh, that take over this common wealth of the faith and create a cohesive, singular uh, practical modern religion. And they wish to reorganize society, Hindu society, on the basis of caste, uh, the caste society, or all the four castes, on the basis of Brahmanic ethos. Since it is difficult to convert all of them to be Brahman, so uh, they should be organized on the basis uh, of the Brahmanic ethos, uh, essentially because the demand of modernity is that all the citizens of a nation should be equal. It's a qualitarian process. The modern process is a qualitarian process. So they have to be equal. So they have to be trained, socialized on the basis of Brahmanic ethos. But at the same time, they wish to create a hierarchical communal society in which Hindu community is placed above all the communities. Because India or Bharat uh, essentially is for the Hindus. That is the way a hierarchical structure in which they wish to create Hindu Rashtra through Ram Rajya. Uh, Rashtra is a nation or, uh, and uh, uh, Ram Rajya is essentially a country that is governed by the Hindu Dharma. So through this uh, process, uh, they wish to face the uh, challenges of modernity, uh, the, the essentially the modernist uh, values of rationality, popularity, and progress. And that essentially is Hindu nationalism. So Hindu nationalism, Hindutva part particularism, wanted to preserve Brahmanic upper caste and their propertyite interest through participating in the process of modernization and tapping new sources of power, social, political, and economic. Indian Muslims are the scapegoats for the ills of Hindu society. Whatever is wrong with the Hindus is because of the Muslims, because they invaded. They are not the contributors, but invader, destroyer, and plunderer, rapist uh, for the India, uh, Indian people and their civilization. And they are responsible for all the injustices 
the pre-partition uh, injustices and the post-partition injustice uh, because uh, they acted as a cohesive vote bank and that's where uh, for the secular and democratic forces uh, pursued them uh, and uh, basically uh, wanted to have their uh, vote bank. Uh, that's why uh, they were given prominence. Hindu nationalism struggle against this Indian uh, nationalism uh, uh, that was trying to reorganize uh, the post-colonial state in India. The Nehruan state essentially based on uh, two basic principles. One, it recognizes the diversity, that India is diverse. And this diversity should be recognized. This unity in diversity was the result that India accepted 15 national languages and reorganized India on the basis of language. Every language group was given a right to have a state of its own, uh, the federal unit uh, of their own. Uh, so over the period of time, this strong uh, centralized uh, Indian state through electoral process uh, emerge as a relatively uh, well-functioning uh, political federation in which uh, politics was essentially defined in these linguistic groups. Secondly, uh, in this diversity, they promoted the concept of secularism. It was not separation of church and state as we generally know, but essentially acceptance of the equality of all religious communities before the law. Secondly, it accepted the group identities and ensure constitutional protection for the preservation of group identities and right, but at the same time, they asserted the right of the state to intervene and introduce social reforms in these uh, minority groups, or in these essentially the religious groups. Uh, that was uh, the justification they gave for the codification of the Hindu personal law. And also it created uh, resentment among the uh, Hindu nationalists uh, because Muslim personal law was not codified. Secondly, they recognized that the problem of India is not cultural, but economic. Uh, it's not religio-cultural, but economic. Uh, India should be economically equalitarian. If you wish to have a democracy, then citizens should be equal to each other. And this thousands of years of subservience of lower caste cannot be overcome overnight and they cannot be democratized unless they are economically uplifted. So the process they adopted was legal and economic. Uh, reservations were uh, made, a certain amount of national resources was reserved for the lower caste. And at the same time, untouchability was uh, uh, declared illegal. Uh, so both legal and uh, economic incentives were given uh, to these lower caste, uh, lower income uh, social groups uh, to uplift them and make them equal to the other social groups so democracy can function. Essentially, over the longer period of time, this secular uh, caste, uh, secular benevolent liberal uh, state of uh, Nairwan state uh, interpreted all these concepts through the lenses of majority. Uh, so emerge as the uh, majoritarianism, where everything what was constitutionally promised to others uh, was essentially interpreted through the lenses of the majority community. That's why Urdu was not like, uh, initially recognized as the second language uh, in uh, UP. And at the same time, number of areas, uh, Muslim school, primary schools were not given funds to open up. And at the same time, at the constituency level, though there was a rhetoric 
uptake of secularism at the center, but at the constituency level, a uh, number of Hindu nationalist uh, concepts of like Kauraksha, promotion of the Hindi language, uh, was taken over uh, by the Congress candidates and promoted. So this majoritarianism essentially uh, asserted the right of the majority uh, to decide about the future of India. But at the same time, it promoted a minorityism as well, where minority was given a space to organize itself and uh, argue and articulate its own interest. And that's where uh, Muslims did uh, articulated uh, their point point of view on Muslim personal law, uh, Article 370, Aligarh uh, University, and num and uh, number of trust and uh, number of uh, historical places uh, that India inherited and Muslim claim it belongs to them. Uh, so entire this process was accepted in part of the minorityism and the classic case of this majorityism and minorityism was uh, the Shah Bano case and Ram Janam Bhumi, uh, where Muslim uh, Women Protection Act was passed and at the same time the gates of the uh, Babi Masjid was opened uh, for the Hindu pilgrimage as well. Okay. So uh, essentially the Nehruan state uh, ended up one as a majoritarian and minoritarian state. The mixed economy didn't uh, give much to India, uh, but over a longer period of time, they did accumulate it uh, and built an infrastructure on which a modern economy can be constructed. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, the mixed economy, end of the day, resulted into a bureaucratization of the economy, the so-called license and permanent raj. Uh, that was established and through which patronage was uh, distributed uh, to the workers of the ruling party. And from 1984 onward, they started to have the market reforms uh, from Rajiv Gandhi period onward. Uh, and this was the process of creation uh, of a new uh, class of bourgeois. New bourgeois class, uh, essentially elite middle class urban areas uh, that was benefited from this uh, progressive, uh, gradual process of market reforms in India and virtually created a new uh, social group of the capitalists within uh, India. Hindu nationalists uh, attempted to delegitimize this state. The first argument for them was that the, all the principles of the Nehruan states are non-Indian, Western ideas, and essentially rob Hindus of their right to govern themselves. Uh, Muslims have uh, 50 states where they can live. They have Pakistan. They have created Pakistan. But uh, Hindus were not liberated. They are still subject to the Western ideas and uh, they wanted to uh, liberate Hindus and govern Hindus on the basis of their own ideology. Uh, and they termed this entire secularist process as the uh, pseudo-secularism. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, the interpretations of this idea was very interesting. Uh, like say, Arya's uh, what was the origin of Aryas? Uh, Congress accepted uh, that uh, Aryans came from outside India and made India their home uh, 10,000 years back. If 10,000 years back, uh, Aryas can come from outside, then 1,000 years back, Muslims can also come. Uh, so principle is accepted. But in case of Hindu nationalism, it rejected this. Uh, concept and they say uh, Aryas are indigenous people, they were born within India and uh, rest are the invaders and outsiders. Second argument was that even these ideas were implemented with bad intention. Essentially it was an appeasement process for the minorities for simply their vote bank. 
to get their votes. That's why uh, this appeasement process was initiated. And it is also not in the interest of the minorities as well. It is the same argument when uh, they were amending uh, the Article 370 uh, in case of and dividing Kashmir into two uh, regions. Uh, they made the same argument that now Kashmir will be integrated into the mainstream India and will be uh, part of uh, the larger uh, market and it will benefit the ordinary Kashmiris. Third, it was against the will of the people. It was not against, uh, it was not a democratic process. It was an undemocratic process because Hindu majority's will was ignored. So on all three levels of being indigenous with intentions and democratic principle of popular consent, these, this secular state was not a legitimate state. This Nervan state was not a legitimate state. And that was the basis on which they delegitimize the Nervan state. And their mobilization strategy was a combination of two basic principles. One, spreading communal hate and fear. Uh, hate because Muslims were the outsiders, destroyers, and the fear that Muslims are still conspiring to take over this entire demographic base uh, argument that uh, Congress ruled India with 30% votes, and soon Muslims will be 30% since they act and behave like a vote bank. Uh, they will uh, elect a Muslim government and they will govern India and Hindus will be uh, enslaved again of the Muslims. So this fear and then the entire terrorism and Middle East uh, rise of the Muslims uh, was used uh, entire this process to feed this fear. But at the same time, they promise a clean and good government. And the instrument was the emotional uh, appeal of the Ram Janma Bhumi. Uh, essentially, Ram Janma Bhumi is not simply to erect a Ram Mandir, but reclaim India for the Hindus. The India that was lost to Hindus should be reclaimed by the Hindus and govern according to their own samsakriti. So social change, for the social change, Sangh Parivar, uh, penetrated into the society through their school system of Vishwa Hindu Prashad, their own RSS run school systems, their me media, and these uh, mass contact movements of Yatra uh, through which uh, they preach this entire message and on a perpetual and constant level. Secondly, there was an instrument of communal violence. The moment you have a communal violence, you sharpen the fault lines between the two communities. So this process of sharpening the fault lines were essentially done through the process of communal violence. And they had in this, the support of new bourgeois class that was emerging uh, after the uh, reforms, market reforms in the Indian economy. It was a very successful strategy. In 1984, they had two seats and 7.7 .7 votes. In 1988, when first government came, it was 25.6% vote with 82 seats. And then after this, uh, it was not a very successful model uh, because they contested uh, 2004 election with Shining India the slogan of shining India. And uh, actually India was not shining. Uh, so they lost the election and 10 years rule of the Congress was followed. Uh, then emerged the personality of uh, Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi essentially sold his own personality and the Gujarat model. Gujarat model was the best Hindutva model. It created the caste harmony all the caste from lower to higher were behaving harmoniously in Gujarat. Secondly, under Modi, it was the third uh, most prosperous state in India. And thirdly, 
Muslims were subjugated. So all uh, the prerequisites uh, to make a Hindutva state were very much there in the Gujarat model. And the Gujarat model very, very successfully was sold by Modi and the machine of RSS. And 2014, they had 284 seats of Lok Sabha and 31% vote. And 2019, it was 37.5% votes and 303 seats of the Lok Sabha. It's a gradual process of Hindutva, uh, which they have it, uh, followed when they came into power. In 1988 to 2004, it was a rhetorical Hindutva. It was a coalition government. They could not implement their Hindutva agenda. Uh, so essentially, a rhetoric of Hindutva uh, was promoted. Uh, at very important positions, especially uh, the places uh, where they can influence the rewriting of textbooks and history, uh, RSS men were uh, posted and they were given immense funds to promote the Hindutva ideology. Uh, they essentially in this process and through rhetoric try to make Hindutva as a new normal a new way of life, uh, acceptable, legitimate, no more on the periphery and delegitimate uh, within the Nehruan state, but a legitimate force in Indian politics. From 1914 to 1919, it was a process of soft Hindutva. Uh, essentially, they avoided the hardcore Hindu agenda, uh, but they did allow with impunity uh, their sang parivar to function at the societal level. So the best examples were the Gauraksha movements. Uh, virtually uh, the Gauraksha movement, uh, the vigilantes of Gauraksha movements uh, acted throughout India. Uh, and we have this uh, figure of 44 Muslims were lynched, uh, almost 200 and 90, around 290s were injured. And more than 5,000 smaller businesses uh, were destroyed uh, in this entire process. Uh, the so-called love jihad, uh, essentially uh, this provided them basis to ban the cause slaughter. Uh, second, the love jihad where Muslim uh, young men were accused of seducing uh, Hindu women uh, and girls uh, to convert them to Islam. Uh, so uh, anti-conversion law were introduced in most of the states that were governed by the uh, BJP. And then the Garvapsi, the Muslims and Christian of Hindu regions were asked to convert back to Hinduism. Uh, it was basically a continuation of the Shuddhi movement. 2019 election essentially provided them opportunity to implement the hard Hindutva. And that's where we have uh, the process of initiation of codification of the Muslim personal law through uh, legislation on triple talaq amendment in uh, Article 370 uh, with reference to Kashmir, uh, Citizen Amendment Act, and uh, the complete destruction of the Babri Masjid and the construction of Ram Janma Bhumi uh, by the Vishwa Hindu Parshat. Uh, Supreme Court essentially uh, given entire title of that uh, land uh, to Vishwa Hindu Parshat. Uh, it was just one of the party among the three. Uh, rest of the two were told uh, you can have five acres somewhere else. Uh, the issue of Babri Masjid was not that it is simply a masjid where the, uh, people uh, people use them for uh, prayer, but essentially it was a historical heritage, and Muslim failed to protect their historical heritage under this hard Hindutva. The tensions which this Hindutva has created in Indian Union first. <sighs> RSS and entire Sankarvar, BJP included, wanted to have a strong center, uh, promote Hindi language and upper caste uh, social structures. 
uh, that's where uh, the tension lies. Uh, and the reflection was very much th there in the National uh, Population Register, National Register of the Citizen, uh, uh, where this NPR and NRC, uh, essential point is not that it was promoted, essential point is that almost 13 states refuse to implement it. First time, uh, it was a tension within the Indian Federation. And it can uh, continue if there is no legal remedy uh, for their objections. Secondly, uh, Jammu and Kashmir was partitioned. Without the consent of the people, uh, Jammu Kashmir assembly was suspended at that time and the federation representative on the behalf of the people, the governor, actually given this, gave this consent. So anytime, any unit uh, can be divided through this entire process. So constitutional guarantees uh, for the protection of a unit uh, is virtually uh, become under serious questions. Uh, Bengal consider itself to be the next and that's gone and on, on. It creates over a longer period of time tension within the Federation. Second is the economic reform between rich and poor. BJP is openly a pro-capitalist. This entire concept of integral humanism uh, is essentially based a combination of capitalist system with dharma. Voluntarily, uh, you contribute to the society, but otherwise you have a right to your own property and maximize your profit. Uh, the reaction to all this process, the best example is the Kisan movement, uh, where uh, the lower uh, class uh, struggling, uh, middle class, lower middle class, and the lower class uh, resenting this entire process. Within uh, Sangh Parivar itself, uh, the Savadeshi Manch is also uh, created tensions for the RSS. So uh, economic reforms, uh, this capitalist agenda is the second source of tension, the broader source of tension. Secularism, uh, it is not simply uh, uh, with the minorities, but essentially within uh, Hindu community as well, uh, between secularist and non-secularist, traditionalist, uh, traditionalist Hindus, the Gandhian Hindus, uh, all these uh, Hindu groups, uh, they are also uh, facing uh, the tension at the same time. Uh, so this masculine Hinduism, uh, the best example is the Kerala, uh, where they face uh, from uh, the feminist uh, clash uh, from the masculine interpretation of the Hinduism. Muslims, uh, issue of Muslim is serious. Uh, they are not a small community. They claim that they are around uh, 25 crore uh, and they are 14%, 15% of India. So it's a very significant, it's a majority in itself and they have a strong sense of uh, identity, distinct identity. And then the entire process justifies the creation of Pakistan. We all would, be, would have been suffering the same fate as the Indian Muslims are suffering now. Uh, much of our time and energies would have been wasted to preserve our identity, then to participate in the process of modernization. How much damage it can uh, done to Indian Union? Uh, it will be a serious uh, tension over the longer period of time. Uh, but will it, we quickly ask the question of will it, it disintegrate? Uh, essentially, uh, there are three major advantages that India have. One, RSS is a very patient organization. They have patiently pursue uh, this process at a social level. So whenever process tries to get out of hand, RSS put brakes on it. They know uh, it can create a serious problem. Uh, last time when Babri Masjid was uh, damaged uh, in 1992, uh, there was 
uh, bomb lost and reaction in Bombay and RSS simply stopped the process. And then it was put on hold for a longer period of time. So they also are not, not rushing, uh, but they know uh, the uh, political power is good for their project. It is a social movement, but like to be uh, in political power. That's why uh, Bharatiya Janasangh was created uh, to provide political support to this social group. And that's how the entire uh, BGP mobilization strategy was supported by the RSS. To have a political support is more important and follow a gradual process. Secondly, Indian electoral institutions. Indian electoral system is very powerful. Uh, opposition do have a space to exist. And they are uh, winning elections. Uh, they are governing their states. And there is a possibility they can remove uh, Bhartiya Janta Party uh, in power. Uh, though it will take uh, some more time, uh, but still it is there. Congress faced the same process. BJP maybe faced the same process, but electoral system is very much there and it is sustaining in there, the federation. Thirdly, no external power is interested to disintegrate India. Uh, China is not interested. Uh, they have their own problem of Tibet. They have more than $80 billion trade with India, where $50 billion essentially in favor of China. Pakistan don't have a potential. And rest of the power wish to powers, the Western powers uh, like to use India as an economic market and uh, so-called uh, balance against India. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sir, uh, a very, very absorbing, very educative uh, discourse. And uh, that is what we definitely expect out of, a, out of an academic. And you bring uh, a very uh, clear perspective in this 2D horizon that you have given. So there are a couple of uh, points agitating uh, our minds. And before we open the floor for uh, question and answers, uh, I want wish to uh, highlight one thing for your consideration that this slow process of uh, cultural recidivism or what we call uh, uh, homogenization of Indian society. So this is uh, an attempt by RSS to homogenize this society, to erase the cultural symbols not only cultural, but religious symbols. So these are very, very emotive issues. And uh, there would be a pushback and resistance by those uh, elements which since uh, centuries, just like mainstream Hindus, have been part of this community, like Sikhs, for instance, like uh, the Northeastern states, and there are Christians, there are uh, agnostics, and there are uh, indigenous faiths. Uh, and there th is a complete belt, which uh, erstwhile Adivasis, and now they have rebranded themselves as Maoists. Now we know that uh, RSS is a very, very... Uh, organized entity and they are co-opting not only other communities but they have included a muslim wing also by the name of muslim rashtriya manch mrm they are giving so much in incentives and incentivizing all these excluded communities to be part of this game and uh, work towards uh, rss goals so unwitting accomplices are also getting into this so there are two competing strains, one that uh, push, pushes back for its identity and one that is being co-opted. So uh, as a researcher, as a scholar, and as an author who's written books, uh, how would you uh, see both these competing strains and its future on Indian polity? I 
think uh, electoral, uh, I think the electoral politics, uh, if they continue uh, with the electoral politics, uh, that will be the uh, greater arbiter and kind of a, a hurdle in creating extremist uh, trends within uh, the Indian community. Uh, so uh, they have just lost elections in Bengal, uh, basically five states, only one they were able to win. I mean, and now they are going to contest, especially in United Provinces, uh, where they have the one of the icon of Hindutva, uh, Yogi Aditya. Uh, that's that's the only place where they have very much a religious figure uh, appointed as uh, chief minister. So it's a very clear uh, sign uh, the way they want to behave. Uh, it is number one. I think it will be the uh, electoral system uh, where uh, that will be a kind of a insurance for India to survive, and it has been uh, insurance of, for India. Uh, India has survived because it had election elections. Uh, otherwise, it's a it's a, a very much a centralized constitution. It has, and, but over the period of time. Uh, the units have emerged as independent and uh, uh, people are expressing themselves, new participants are coming in and joining. Resistance will be very much there, uh, but at the same time, soft Nindutva is being adopted by everybody. Uh, Congress started to adopt it uh, since 1980 when Mrs. Indira Gandhi first uh, started to invite religious figures into the Prime Minister House. Uh, same was with the Rajiv Gandhi, and then even now, uh, the soft Hindutva is taking or taking over. We call it soft Hindutva or the Congress version of the majoritarianism. Uh, that is very much uh, there. Uh, Muslims, uh, a serious question will be of the Muslims, uh, how Muslims will behave. Uh, I think uh, after the Citizen Amendment Act, uh, the Muslim response did surprise a number of them. Uh, even surprise uh, Bharatiya Janta Party as well. Uh, there were around 200 and around less than 300, but 296, 98 places uh, where these women uh, dharnas were uh, placed. And it was a very uh, strong moment. It was a combination of uh, the left and the Muslim minority. Uh, that will be a serious challenge. And that where uh, we need to see the future uh, for political fault lines of India, uh, where the real conflict was there. Now, the argument I'm simply making, uh, India has a mechanism, uh, the electoral mechanism, to resolve or at least contest uh, its uh, provide competitive arena uh, for competing ideas. Uh, competing ideas are very much there, uh, and they are being resolved through the electoral process. Till the time that is there, I think uh, it will be a step of poverty. Uh, but if they try to suppress it, uh, then I think there will there will there were basically some voices uh, which they claimed that in 2019 election this RSS machinery. It was a mess. It is a massive electoral machine. Uh, Amit, Amit Shah. Amit Shah was the only person who predicted that BJP will win more than 300 seats. Uh, no other, no other, uh, but Amit Shah. So I think uh, he, uh, that do create a serious fear in competitors. Uh, and there were allegations that some hanky panky was done uh, during those elections. Uh, if this uh, allegations, this type of atmosphere continues of fear, uh, then uh, it can aggravate. Uh, otherwise, uh, India do have a mechanism in which competing ideas come in, compete, and uh, move on. Uh, but yes, uh, there are problems which they cannot resolve, and they have failed to resolve. And the biggest is uh, Naxal Bari movement. Uh, Maxwell Bari movement is a, is a serious challenge. 
uh, to the Indian society. But still it has uh, no external support. Without external support, modern states are very powerful. They can penetrate in these groups, they can coerce them, they can destroy them within. So a number of uh, instruments are available. Looking at the present, India is a rising state, uh, politically and economically. And with foreseeable future, it will continue to rise. But if it enters into some adventures, whether outside or inside, uh, then these uh, fault lines uh, will be very dangerous for India. So India uh, is perceived to be a state uh, that is uh, the soft state that cannot, that do not have the stomach uh, or the kill factor uh, to become a great power. Uh, that is the basic argument that we will take. Uh, India continue to be a uh, soft power uh, because it will not be able to have this uh, kill factor uh, because internal cohesion will always be uh, questionable. So India in future, I think, uh, the fault, because of these all fault lines will be consumed within rather than outside. Uh, Dr. Saab, uh, you mentioned internal cohesion. Now, Nehruvian uh, secularism and the secular constitution was the center of gravity. It was the glue that bound uh, Indian com, uh, uh, you know, into a political union. Now, once that glue is coming unstuck because of this uh, religious particularism, we know that uh, the popular appeal has also been lost. There are states like Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, and Kerala, where the polls showed that BJP's appeal was quite uh, low on the index. But once the political uh, you know, alliance making and those uh, machinations were done, so they could just cobble together a coalition and still they won these. Uh, is it uh, because of this uh, bourgeois that you mentioned, that corporate elite whose interests are being served by BJP, and we saw one of the manifestations in the shape of this farmer uh, resistance uh, from Punjab. Is that bourgeois so strong and its uh, nexus with the RSS is giving them a kind of uh, support that despite uh, larger numbers, all those opposition parties have been unable to translate their uh, numbers into electoral victory. I think it's a normal politics. Uh, coalition building, uh, it has been there in India. Uh, there have been horse trading uh, in, uh, after the loss of election, a uh, loss of the prime ministership in 1996. Uh, they did uh, almost the same thing in UP. That was the first time when they came into power in uh, United Province, uh, horse trading. Horse trading is part of Indian politics. So it's a normal politics that is uh, taking place in India. Uh, but yes, uh, they do have uh, massive support uh, from the uh, capitalist class. Uh, there was very interesting speeches by uh, Bilab, uh, sorry, uh, Rahul Gandhi and uh, Prime Minister Nendra Modi uh, on the uh, Kisan movement and very explicitly uh, both actually uh, talk about the future economic structure of India. Uh, Rahul talk of the mixed economy, uh, lower people, uh, lower classes, uh, the so-called uh, the basic support base of Congress and uh, Nendra Modi talk about the pure capitalist uh, West-oriented uh, India. Uh, so this broader two uh, strains are very much there uh, in India and it will continue to play. Uh, but how much it will, uh, how much the resources will go down to the people? In 2019, uh, one of the element with most of the analysts uh, ignored was the small loans for motorcycle, building of a small house, uh, the small business, uh, some thousands, 50,000 to 100,000 uh, kind of a small loan that reached 
throughout India. And actually, that was uh, the real vote which they uh, affected. So they are not simply, they are not ignoring it. Uh, in case of uh, beef issue, uh, moment uh, it, it uh, uh, trespassed into the Dalit territory. Uh, Modi Sahib, who is most of the time is silent on the killing of the Muslims uh, or the violence against the Muslims, uh, was very good prompt to stop them. And that's where uh, Gauraksha vigilantes were controlled uh, by the RSS uh, because they were uh, creating a reaction within the Dalit community and Dalit voteman. Uh, that. So they are very much aware of it. Uh, and still, uh, I think over a longer period of time, uh, these tensions will be very much there. Uh, economic will be on the top of it. Uh, there are states where people are living, uh, or 30 person families are living on one acre of land. And the number of peasantry, kisans who are committing suicide is continuously rising in India. Uh, so economic crisis will be there. Uh, but India has been facing this crisis for a longer period of time. The biggest crisis is now uh, that uh, awareness is coming into the people. They were poor, uh, but they didn't know it. Now they are poor and they know it. Uh, but still, uh, I think uh, the identity politics uh, did uh, create a Hindu vote bank. Uh, and initially, uh, they uh, captured the uh, Congress vote bank. Uh, later on, the caste vote bank, and now also they have, uh, uh, after 2019 election, the six-person vote bank, essentially of the regional parties. And first time, uh, regional party vote bank has dropped to 44% of India. So it's a very powerful vote bank, uh, but from 53%, it has dropped to uh, 44%. So it's almost a 9% drop in this vote bank. Is it a permanent phenomenon? That is the basic question. Uh, is it the Moody phenomena or the permanent phenomena? I think it's it's kind of a mix. Uh, it's a mix. Uh, it definitely, uh, this uh, almost 17, 16% vote, uh, which they have acquired, uh, is a mixture of uh, Modi Saab, his personality, uh, failure of the opposition to capture those vote bank, vote bank uh, reach out to the vote bank. There is virtually uh, no personality in the opposition that can compete with Modi Saab. Uh, he is, at the moment, a larger than life figure. Uh, he is a uh, very powerful uh, personality. Uh, and he don't have ideas of his own, but his idea is Hindutva. Uh, unlike uh, Nehru, he don't have his own idea. He's not his own man as, as a way, uh, but he is representing Hindutva. And uh, it, so is this vote will be there permanently for the BJP or uh, with the decline of his personality or question marks against his personality, the BJP will lose this vote bank. That will be uh, something that will, we should see in the future election. Just one point, uh, India do have now uh, almost a trained voter uh, that decide about uh, dual ticket. Uh, they will be voting for BJP for the center, and they may be voting for uh, their regional party uh, at, at the region. And this is happening. Uh, and we have just seen that's why BJP lost election uh, in, in states uh, where they uh, won uh, previously. And even uh, they have won those states where Congress, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, uh, the three states, uh, just with few months uh, before the election, they did, they did had a, a regional victory but they lost. So Indian voter is also uh, making the same decisions. Uh, but what motivates them, I think it's the mixture of uh, ideas, uh, uh, the Hindu ideas, and uh, the incentive, the economic incentives. 
Uh, we all know that uh, these populist movements and populist leaders they thrive on economic uh, strength. Uh, we have uh, other models in the world, and we see that the populist leader, as long as he he or she does well economically, the country is prosperous. Uh, there is internal cohesion, and the electorate votes for him, him or her. But uh, we see the Indian economy also sliding a bit, and uh, there are now uh, some internal, uh, uh, you know, uh, fractures also because of uh, the bourgeois and the other uh, landed uh, interests, their own clashes. So, uh, do you see do you see this uh, Indian economy's slide getting translated into less popular appeal of BJP, RSS combined, and Modi? Yes, there is a possibility, but I think uh, election in South Asia are combination of uh, various factors. Uh, performance is one. Uh, Performance is associated with the party and the personality that is uh, leading them. Uh, second is the constituency, the way tickets are distributed, the way coalitions are built, even not simply at the state level, district level, in the simple constituency level. And third is the way the elections are constructed, uh, conducted. Uh, the entire machinery. Uh, so it's a combination of three. Uh, BJP has proved to be a very efficient uh, in case of the electoral machinery, uh, distribution of the tickets, uh, construction of uh, the coalition, and using uh, Modi's personality. Uh, till the time this mix continues, I think uh, they will survive. Uh, still, uh, he is his uh, his his numbers uh, polls numbers are more than seventy two percent. Despite COVID, despite slide down, all these things, uh, because virtually there is no alternative. One is a normative uh, kind of uh, observation. Uh, our behavior in, in a South Asia is also kind of a uh, royalist. Uh, once we pick a king, we try to stick with the king. So we, Moody also had this attachment of uh, this normativeness, uh, uh, the concept of a charismatic personality or People essentially feel secure. Is there uh, some father-like figure? Is there great, great figure? Uh, something like this, and don't want to change it. Uh, that's why uh, you see uh, Nehru never lost election. Um, Indra never just once she lost election. She came back immediately. Uh, same was the case with uh, number of regional uh, leaders. Uh, Jatoy Basu uh, ruled uh, West Bengal for 30 years. Uh, so that type of uh, royalist uh, imagination is very much there. Royalty is something there. Uh, uh, maybe uh, it's, it's a normative. Um, I really am not going to <laughs> give numbers on it, uh, but our behavior do sometimes reflect in that way. So survival of uh, Moody uh, charisma is dependent on number of these things. So any questions from the house is open? Uh, yes, Thank you so much for the such an informative discussion. Sir, as you have rightly pointed out, the aim of the local economy has become uh, massive across the country, uh, where fringe uh, uh, figures like uh, uh, Savarkar, even the Puram Bhutte, are now appeared uh, as national heroes. So, do you think that there is any uh, counter narrative or any competing idea which has a chance to sort of push back this Hindutva ideology in the future? Do you see any potential in any uh, competing political parties of India? Or do you think it is now become a norm 
and every other political party will have to employ some elements of the right to their own narrative. Thank you, sir. Uh, Answering first of last year uh, impression, I think yes, uh, this um, Hinduanization of Indian politics is definitely taking place. Uh, every party is now taking Hindutva uh, discourse into account. They don't want to be on the wrong side of Hindutva. Uh, even if they are uh, offend, uh, they are struggling against that Hindutva. Uh, so that is very much there. Alternative, not yet. Uh, virtually there is uh, old time tested uh, ideas are there. Uh, left is discredited. Uh, caste parties lost uh, in UP election, the Smart Party and uh, Mojan Smart Party. Regional parties are still functioning well. 44% uh, vote is quite a vote. Uh, but, uh, and they had very powerful bargaining position at the center. And all the time they had it. Uh, but essentially, uh, because of this 303 votes, uh, seats, the BJP won. This time they have less clout at the center, but uh, in future, if in BJP do not repeat this performance, and I don't think, uh, still it's difficult to make a prediction, uh, but I don't think they will be repeating this performance again. Uh, so uh, regional parties will be very much there. I think a uh, number of uh, uh, gravities uh, will be there, center of gravities will be there. Uh, Muslims should not be ignored. Uh, they do have, uh, but at this moment, they don't have to have the centralized. Uh, Shaheen Bagh did emerge as a very powerful uh, force. And this combination of the left and uh, the Muslim community, uh, youngsters, uh, supporting uh, constitutionalism and uh, secularism was almost a new thing. Uh, but it's all happening within India, not outside India. Uh, virtually, the so-called uh, anti-Indianness is not there. And that, I, I think, is the success of Hindutva. Uh, because it transcends the fault lines. Uh, first, Hindu vote bank, which was 80%, was divided into caste, into pro uh, ideological lines and the regions. Now it is transacting uh, this and making a cohesive. So it is kind of a uh, positive factor for uh, India that the majority community is getting together. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is uh, negative because it is creating fear factor uh, in others and promoting the absolutist tendencies. But yes, uh, the alternative uh, uh, alternative personality is not there uh, because both time, uh, 2014 and 2019, uh, BGP ran its campaign as a presidential campaign. It was a vote for Modi. Uh, so still uh, any personality that can challenge with stature, uh, Modi is not there. So answering your question uh, as a broader strategy, I think uh, secularism, reinterpretation of secularism uh, with much more equalitarian prospects uh, less with the previous majoritarian minoritarian divide, a kind of a new interpretation of uh, secularism will be promoted by this uh, young group uh, that supported the Shaheen Bagh. Uh, and that will be the serious challenge at the societal level uh, for Hindutva. Uh, and I think, and then it will be the coalition making. Uh, how regional parties arrange and rearrange themselves uh, with these, uh, uh, but, uh, and how Congress re-emerge. Congress still has demonstrated in last all elections that it still have 20% vote bank. 
It's a very loyal vote bank. Uh, Any time, just few percentage here and there, and everything will be changed. Uh, so it's, I think, the behavior of the Congress, the regional parties, and the new center, the young that is emerging, uh, that will be kind, kind of a counterbalance to BJP. Hello, sir. My name is Hamdan Akhrat. I just had a question regarding this analogy, which is drawn by different scholars and academics, uh, that white supremacy in the United States is very similar to Hindu supremacy or Hindu in India. Do you agree with this analogy? I think there are certain trends in academia. If we challenge them, we challenge them at the cost of ourselves. Huh? I, I think it, it's a very much uh, Hindu nationalism. Uh, the rise of Moody is uh, very much a domestic phenomenon. Uh, as interpreting it with reference to others help us develop a theory but doesn't explain uh, the domestic level. Uh, it does explain the rise of uh, kind of a new class, new urban class. Uh, that is uh, that that is looking for security, uh, direction. Uh, it is living in this new capitalist world. Uh, where you don't have a secure life. Uh, India is uh, the so-called uh, security, which was there gradually uh, removing. Uh, so that was the common uh, point. Uh, second, uh, assertion of the indigenous cultures. That was very much uh, local phenomena. Uh, the, Asian and African phenomena, and it continues. Uh, the second colonization, which we call. Uh, so, uh, Moody Sahib, uh, or the BGP, rise of the BJP, is byproduct of that. Uh, third, I think, is uh, religion does provide security, uh, kind of uh, answers in an unsecure world, make you secure. Uh, it was very much there in the absence of, or the failure of the communist ideology. Religion did try to uh, replace. That's where the entire uh, uh, religio-cultural, reinterpreted religio-cultural tradition was uh, actually the strength of the identity politics. Uh, that was very much there. Uh, but to link them with uh, those white supremacists, I, I think uh, slightly uh, different. Here it's a majority community that is uh, looking for its place uh, in a new structure. Claimant on the behalf of the majority community are actually trying to look for their place. They're actually, they are losing uh, their dominance of 500 years, the white, uh, the whiteness uh, which ruled all of us uh, since the rise of Europe, uh, it was the decline, and that was the insecurity. Here, actually, it's the uh, community which lost, and what very much uh, at the local level, uh, trying to reclaim uh, what it thinks belongs to it. So it was very much, uh, uh, very much a kind of a revivalist movement. It is a very much a revivalist movement. It is using uh, present uh, trajectories, uh, the present jargons, uh, but it is very much, I think, is a, a domestic Indian phenomenon. Uh, it did have a support sometime from the outside trends, but not much. It is very much a domestic phenomenon. Yes, from uh, amongst the guests, anyone? Anybody? Yes, please. Thank you so much, sir, for attending the conversation.
Is India is a democracy? It's a very serious question. Um, it is following uh, electoral uh, process, uh, and it sustained this entire process because there was an elite consensus. Uh, and with the passage of time, it did create its consequences, which appears like uh, democratic uh, process. But still, it's not individualistic society. It's a group society. So elections are uh, contested on the basis of pattern-client relationship, uh, rhetoric. Uh, which is sometimes caste rhetoric, sometimes religious rhetoric, uh, sometimes uh, sectarian rhetoric, communal rhetoric. So uh, people are also some making emotional uh, decisions. And that what particularist ideologies are, they make people emotional and less uh, rational. Uh, so uh, on this level, yes, uh, Indian experiment is facing something new. But till today, except making uh, an environment, they have made an environment of impunity. Uh, if you are committing crime against uh, one community, uh, virtually uh, you will uh, not be uh, tried by the law, and it is happening. Uh, you will be ignored by the institutions, uh, police, administration, judiciary. Uh, they are all behaving uh, in a communi uh, communal terms. Uh, that element is very much there. But it was there previously, now it is, uh, that was implicit, now it is explicit. Um, report simply talk about 60% uh, uh, arrests were made by them because the people were Muslims. Conviction rates of the Muslims is higher. Uh, people who are in jail, the Muslim rate is higher. Muslim uh, contribution or participation in, in, in the uh, Indian economy is around 3% when they are 14 to 15%. Uh, all this is very much there. Now it is very much explicit. Uh, but uh, they have not undermined uh, the electoral system. Uh, that consensus has not been broken. Uh, last time they won election of the Lok Sabha but lost in Delhi. Within a few months, uh, same is taking place now. Uh, so that electoral system is intact. Electoral democracy is very much there. Uh, but uh, this progress towards the real democracy of India, I think that is, that is suffering because people are again uh, uh, being mobilized on the basis of emotional rhetoric and less uh, people are being trained politically to make rational decisions at the so-called cost and benefit that if they elect this party, how much beneficial it will be for them. This element is there, uh, but it is being, uh, this process is being hampered uh, by the rhetoric of the BJP. So I agree with you uh, that uh, in the long term, uh, it will promote absolutism, uh, irrationality, uh, by making people more and more emotional uh, 
most of these heinous crimes are not committed by uh, the criminals, but the ordinary people. Uh, all these, uh, this recent uh, Delhi rights, uh, most of the rights were committed by the ordinary young men. Uh, they were educated, they were uh, going to school, colleges, they were normal human beings. But actually these normal human beings are being converted into emotional and rhetorical person. And that is actually a disservice to democracy. So I agree with you uh, to this point. Any other questions? Umar? Yes. Uh, one minute, sir. Thank you for your talk. Um, so taking a few from your uh, remarks, uh, if you were to assume that Hindutva is here to stay uh, in India in one form or another, soft Hindutva, hot uh, Hindutva, would it be prudent for other countries like ourselves, for Pakistan, to have some sort of constructive engagement with this new normal rather than just resorting to condemnations, et cetera, et cetera? I think we are engaging with the Hindutva. Uh, our uh, both elites, uh, the institutional elite and uh, social elite, they are engaging with them. Um, General Musharraf visited India when Vajpayee was there. Uh, Vajpayee was invited and Nawaz Sharif went there. So both social and institutional elite uh, we have recently, I think, uh, reinstated 2003 agreement on Kashmir, uh, the borders, uh, border agreement. So we are engaging with it. Uh, but I think it's the right strategy to tell people what is happening in India. Uh, there is nothing wrong in it. Uh, Sometimes we do exaggerate, uh, maybe. Uh, because uh, that's a tendency we have in media, uh, because there is a trend. So we also have a rhetorical society. Uh, in rhetoric, we swept away. Uh, we have a, a right to tell people that something is happening in India. And it is justifying the creation of Pakistan. In 1930s, after the uh, decay of uh, massive uh, communal clashes, uh, between uh, the Sangathan movements and uh, the Muslims uh, during 1920. Uh, the 30s was a very uh, difficult time for the Muslim uh, because everything failed. Uh, the constitutional way failed and it was end up with the uh, emergence of the Nehru uh, report, the so-called Nehru report we had. Uh, and the majority refused to accept the minority. I think at that time there was a consensus among the Muslim elite that if we do not create a separate homeland, our most of our energies will be wasted in the protection of our identity. Uh, so it just justify Pakistan uh, for our youth. Uh, it's it's virtually justified. It, it's a very simple cost and benefit analysis. We all are sitting here thanks to Pakistan. Otherwise, we would have been raising slogans outside here. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, made fun of our appearance. Even the prime minister uh, will make fun of our appearance. The way we wear the kurta and the shalwar and our beard and everything, we don't need to do this. Huh? Uh, that's an uh, identity preservation. Indian Muslims are facing the same crisis. So I think we have a right to uh, indulge on that point. Secondly, what is happening in India is not simply happening to the Muslims of India. Babri Masjid was not simply their heritage. It was our heritage as well. It was the heritage of the Indians Muslims. We were part of it. We are still part of it. Uh, it is still our heritage. It is still our history. It is still our culture. So I think on that level, it is fine. But yes, uh, we are engaging with the uh, Hindutva. Uh, rest, whatever is happening is the byproduct of the balance of power. And uh, in the changing world, I think we are on a weaker side. Uh, 
and that's why India uh, has more options and we have the less option. So we are actually mixing two phenomena at the social level and uh, the strategic level, and then trying to understand it. And the more we think we are weaker here, the more we emphasize here and the more uh, rhetorical we come. But otherwise, I think we are doing the same thing. We should do it. And there is a very much a debate uh, that we should normalize our relationship with India. Uh, there is a willingness on this side. There is a less willingness on the other side. Uh, because they think uh, they can create a new normal between India and Pakistan. They can create a new red lines uh, between India and Pakistan. And they are very, they think it's an opportunity because of the strategic weakness, they think it's an opportunity uh, to uh, this South Asian state systems, mutual interaction can be rewritten. So, my uh, my argument is still that we are more rhetorical because we are strategically weak, uh, but we are doing exactly the same thing. We are recognizing India, uh, but we have the right to tell our people that look, we were right. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think. Uh, all the important questions have been very well articulated and answered. And uh, we carry some very important takeaways that uh, this rise of majoritarianism in India, in fact, would be countered by equalitarian uh, nationalism, and which would emanate from the society itself. And the meanwhile, uh, our engagement strategy should be based upon sovereign equality and highlighting uh, the excesses of majoritarianism. With this, sir, we uh, close this discourse and we look forward to uh, future interaction with you as well to come and enlighten us on this aspect. Thank you so much. If I could just request Acting President Epi to please present a memento to our esteemed speaker.